So welcome back, everyone. I think in the interest of time, I think we'll just keep to the schedule in a rigid Germanic fashion. <laughs> and uh, welcome back. I hope you had a nice uh, lunch. Uh, and now we will continue with the next panel, which is on uh, criminal justice. And it's Maria Rune Bernadotter, who will be taking over from me as chair of this panel as soon as she finishes uh, her interview. <laughs> uh, so I would like to invite uh, the panelists, either all of you, or you can sit down here and watch it, and you, you decide. But uh, first we have uh, Linnea, who uh, you have your presentation in here. Yes. Can you hear me good? Perfect. OK. You want to come up here? Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this subject. Um, the title of my presentation is Freedom of Speech is the Foundation of a Democratic Social Order justice themes in defamation judgments related to Me Too. A consequence of Me Too in many countries was defamation trials. Um, and in this paper, I will present findings from a study of Swedish judgments involving victims of sexual assault who were prosecuted for defamation after they shared information about their alleged perpetrators on social media. There are, and this is a research project, I should say, uh, or this study is part of a larger research project, uh, the Mimi 2 Momentum and its Aftermath, Digital Justice Seeking and Societal and Legal Responses, and it is fund funded by uh, the Swedish Crime Victim uh, Authority and Marianne and Marcus Wallenberg's Stiftelse. Right, 12 district court judgments. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, handed down after the, the initial spread on Me Too in Sweden from December, from December 2017 to uh, December 2020. Um, I have selected judgments where a defendant was prosecuted for providing information about a complainant having sexual assaulted them um from a, a large uh, group of defamation trials in Sweden during this period. So I will first say a couple of facts, so to say, about these cases. Um, all the cases resulted in convictions, either for defamation, for judgments, or gross defamation, eight judgments. Um, in all the cases, the defendant was a woman while the complainant was a man. And in all the cases, the complainant had been identified, so, or the, the post was on a Facebook page, in a Facebook group, or, and or on Instagram. There were penal sanctions imposed in all those cases for defamation. Uh, the most common um, uh, sanction was 30-day fines. And for gross defamation, which uh, of, for gross defamation, uh, imprisonment is um, um, is the um, uh, the sanctions prescribed by law. There was conditional sentence in in, uh, in all cases plus uh, day fines. Uh, compensation was awarded to the complainant in all cases between approximately five hundred to eight thousand euros. Very short about the framework of my analysis. So I've looked at sort of the legal points of departure and the legal effects of these cases and how the judgments relate to, to current law. I've also <clears throat> looked at how judgments represent claims of justice and to which discursive effects they contribute. And this is mostly what I will present today. I'm so sorry about my voice. You can. I hope it will um, bear with me <laughs> all this, this presentation. So I've used kaleidoscopic justice as a theoretical framework to 
analyze uh, the claims of justice. And I use Mc, uh, Claire McLean's and Nicole Westmoreland's um, article here, which describes a justice as uh, consequences, recognition, dignity, voice, prevention, and connectedness. So uh, justice for, for victims. Um, I've also looked at both the sort of the formal, or I should do it like this. So there is both the sort of formal justice seeking aspect in those cases, the criminal justice system, but it's also the informal justice seeking, which usually is described as digital or, or viral justice. Um, we can discuss this later, but I think that these two um, pathways to justice are important uh, for my analysis. Um, short about defamation in, in Sweden. Um, so un, under chapter five, section one, the Swedish criminal code, and the first paragraph states that a person who identifies someone as being a criminal or as having a reprehensible way of life or otherwise provides information li liable to expose that person to the contempt of others is guilty of defamation. Then the second paragraph states that it is not a crime, so it's a sort of defense, right? If the person was either obliged to make a statement, which can happen like in court, if you have to be a witness or, or something like that, it's not uh, applicable in, in these cases I have studied. Or if in view of the circumstances, it was justifiable, justifiable to make a statement and the defendant also shows that the information was true or that he or she had reasonable grounds for it. Um, a bit more about this justifiability assessment because it is very important in these cases. Um, so on the one side, we have the, the complainant's right to honor and dignity. That is sort of the value that the, the defamation um, section wants to protect. Um, it is an old crime and it was justified um, or the, the sort of the grounds for criminalizing defamation points out that in a modern society people is required to coexist in a group of uh, in a group with others so and if one person attacks another by spreading derogatory information about him, this can be a dangerous attack and result in exclusion from the group. So that is sort of on the one side of this scale. Uh, on this side, we also find the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 8, right to, to private life. On the other side, we have the defendant's right to, to freedom of speech, um, which is also mentioned in the ground for criminalizing defamation. Um, it is said that there must be room for a political debate in, in the society. Um, and it is stated that sort of the balance between these two in, interests in conflict must be dependent upon prevailing societal values, which may shift as society develops which means that I argue that there is a relatively large discretionary space to weigh the defendant's right to freedom of speech against the complainant's right to honor and dignity. So um, in all the defamation cases I've studied, the district court determined that for the women to provide the information was not justifiable. As a result, the, co the courts never proceeded to examining whether the information was true or not. There was no, so no evidence about that, or evidence was not allowed about that. Right, I will now describe the justice themes I found in descriptions of the defendant's purposes. Um, because when the court assesses the justifiability, um, it may assign meaning to the defendant's purpose in providing the defamatory information. 
Um, and all the judgments I've studied mention the defendant's purpose in some way. And I've identified four themes. The first theme is telling her story. Uh, for example, <clears throat> and oh, yeah, I should say also, tell her story and do so in relation to me too. Um, for example, I quote, her purpose was to relate what happened and get other people to relate what they had experienced. For her, this was also a way of marking what had happened as a way to get closure. Another example, I quote, the Me Too campaign made her realize that she wasn't alone in this her experience. She also deserves to be listened to and respected. During the Me Too campaign, she was able to talk about it and she received support from her friends on Facebook. I think that we can think of this as justice, both in the form of voice and the form, in the form of sort of recognition for, for one's story. The second theme is getting support. Um, I think this can also be understood as sort of feeling connectedness, being part of, of society. Um, in one case, a lack of support from, from, from friends and family played a role. Um, I quote, she was unhappy when she wrote the post. She felt let down. She had been through a rough time without backup from her friends or family. The purpose of the post was to get a reaction from her friends and family. Uh, also, me too appear here in, in this theme. I quote, her post was because she wanted help and thought that she would get, get help through the me too movement. Um, the third theme is warning others. Um, this can, uh, or I quote, she wanted, in other words, to warn, warn other women about the complainant so that others would not suffer the same thing she had. I think this can be interpreted as justice in the form of prevention. And the last theme, uh, disappointment in the criminal justice system. Uh, seven of these judgments observed that the defendant had filed a police report about the event that she later described on social media. And th but it's only three judgments that explicitly state that the defendant's purpose in providing this information was related to her disappointment um, in the criminal justice system. I think we can this is, this is also about the consequences for the perpetrator. Uh, I quote, she published a post after she heard that the preliminary investigation had been discontinued. She was unhappy and disappointed in the justice system. I will now turn to the court's justifiability assessments and the court's responses to the defendant's purpose. So what do the court do with this? Does it matter? Um, in, and I should say that, that some, about half of the judgments are very short. So basically they say that, well, it's not justifiable and this person should be con convicted of, of defamation. But in, in about half of, or seven of, of the judgments, the court responds to the purpose in their, in their assessment. Um, and often the response seems to be saying what the woman should have done rather than provide information on, on social media or what she could have done within the framework of the law. So telling without naming is suggested in several cases. I quote, Certainly, the defendant was free to talk about what had happened to her and what she experienced in the Facebook group or in other places. Describing to others an event in which you were the victim of an assault or other violation is not a punishable act. So you could have talked about this without naming the perpetrator. Um, the other um, suggestion, so to say, from the courts is 
to say uh, that the defendant could have talked to a smaller circle of people, I quote, regarding the purpose of the information provided, the district court concludes that it was perfectly possible for the defendant to talk about the event with, for instance, her family, her therapist, and the police, and indeed she availed herself of that possibility. There are also other responses, um, which is um, not so common, but, but that I have found. So, uh, for example, um, in, in one case, the court um, talks about the, the purpose of being in a disappointment in the criminal justice system, and the court says that, I quote, the district court can understand that the defendant felt a sense of disappointment in society's failure to take action against the complainant's behavior toward her. Toward her. This did not, however, make publishing the information justifiable. Or, as in judgment D, I quote, nor can a speculative publication of his name for the purpose of perhaps discovering another victim be considered justifiable in the sense intended in the definition of defamation. I think it's also interesting to, to note that the, the courts did not assign Me Too any significance in the justifiability assessments. So, conclusion. I think there are many things to say about these cases, but I will restrict myself to, to some points here. Um, first, I mean, legally speaking, the purpose for which the defendants provided defamatory information did not weigh heavily in the justifiability assessments. But at the same time, the court also reasoned that anti-defamation laws should not be made an obstacle to political conversation and discussions of sexual assault. So, Telling stories about sexual violence and seeking support from others are described as sort of legitimate, legitimate, legitimate purposes, right? It's good to talk about this. You, should, you are allowed to talk about this. It is important to do that. But naming perpetrators is not. Um, I think a, a sort of discursive effect of, of these judgments is that justice as in terms of recognition, voice, consequences, prevention, and connectedness, does not emerge as a political interest. I mean, not a political interest, um, or not, not a political issue weighty enough to tip the scales toward the freedom of speech over individual dignity. So, Victim accounts of sexual violence that name the perpetrator are not a political question involving free speech, one of the cornerstones of democracy. Thirdly, I think an effect of these um, judgments is to saddle crime victims with the responsibility for making sure that if they speak about being sexually assaulted in social media, their story does not contain details that might allow the perpetrator to be identified, because not in all these cases, the name of the perpetrator was there. But the person was, um, uh, a, it was a, a, a possible to identify uh, that the person anyway. And I, I also think that an effect of these um, cases is that they, they uphold the boundary between private and public when it comes to perpetrator identity. They sort of keep the perpetrator invisible. Um, they confine stories about sexual violence that identify a perpetrator to the, to the private sphere. I think this is interesting because for many years, one important issue in feminist theory and practice has been to, has been to deconstruct the boundary between private and public and to assert that sexual violence should not be a family secret, so to say, but a political and a legal issue. And finally, and this is something that I think is very specific for the Swedish, I mean, the way that the Swedish defamation 
a law is constructed because the court must first decide that it was justifiable for the defendant to provide information before it proceeds to consider the, the veracity of the defendant's account. Accounts of sexual violence go unheard in courts. And I think this, this reinforces the picture of a legal system that comes up short when it comes to prosecuting sexual violence as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much, Linnea. Great, you chaired mine and I will chair yours. So the next speaker is Claire McGlynn. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much again to everyone for uh, inviting me here to Hildur Fiola for organizing this conference. Um, many of the themes or issues that I'm going to talk about in relation to justice have been uh, developed and shaped by my many conversations um, with Hildur on these, on these issues. So what I want to do today is um, the themes of the conference are around the justice deficit, um, as it's been talked about in relation to sexual violence survivors, and how we can develop pathways for survivor-centered justice. In addressing those themes, the focus for my presentation is going to be on some of the uh, perspectives of survivors of image-based sexual abuse. And I use that term to mean all forms of the kind of non-consensual taking or sharing or creating of intimate images. So images being taken in um, private settings without consent, uh, images up women's skirts in public, you know, images in toilets and images being shared, that sort of thing. And I want to um, talk about that in the context of the search for justice beyond conventional criminal justice. But I do also want to talk about the foundational role and symbolic role of the criminal law. In essence, I want to hold both these things um, at the same time, that we can search for justice beyond criminal justice, but also reform and transform criminal justice. And I hope by talking about image-based sexual abuse as well, I bring into the conversation the perspectives of you know, a whole nother range of survivors, many of whom do describe their experiences as a form of sexual assault or sexual offending. So my conceptual frame is around um, kaleidoscopic justice, which I've talked about with my colleague, um, Nicole Westmarland. And that's um, the idea of justice, as, as others have mentioned, as it being not linear, it, it's not an obvious starting point, a report to the police and a conviction. It's unpredictable, it's continually shifting. It's a lived, ongoing, ever-evolving experience. I think many of us have talked about this in our work as well, how survivors' perspectives often change over time in relation to their experience. And it differs for many different survivors. And there's themes, um, as Linnea's talked about, about recognition, consequences, dignity, and connectedness, I want to talk about. Um, but I'm like Carl as well today. I brought with me hard copies. So, um, and I don't want to, I don't know if Carl's willing to give his away, but I am willing to give mine away. So if you want to take more information away with you, save me um, carrying it. You see, we didn't know we had so much in common, Carl. Um, in, in talking about some of the survivors' perspectives, I want to draw on some work I did with a number of colleagues across the UK, Australia, and New Zealand um, a couple of years ago, uh, where we interviewed 75 victim survivors of all forms of image-based sexual abuse. And um, some of that is in that report. <laughs> um, so one of, the, one of those first themes um, around uh, recognition and so some of the, uh, these are a couple of quotes from survivors, talked about, I wish that someone had sat him down and said, this is wrong. You know, it, it's that classic sense that someone just wanted the perpetrator to understand what they'd done was wrong. An apology or confirmation that he deleted everything and that he knows he did something wrong. There's also themes around voice and restorative justice around some of the things we're discussing here today. So Mary had images taken and posted on a WhatsApp group without her consent. 
And she talked about how I think looking back now, an apology would have been nice or some sort of ownership of, okay, I thought you would have been okay with that and I'm sorry, I should have asked. Danielle expressed her wish to confront him, again, something we, we see sometimes about it, and just tell him what he'd done, like how awful it made me feel, just to make it clear to him that what he did was wrong, why it was wrong, and what the consequences were of it. So that sense of wanting to convey to the perpetrator the nature of their harms and what they'd experienced and gone through. More around voice, restorative justice, but also into this idea that um, just a, a sense of justice for many survivors is about prevention. It's about helping to stop this happening to many more people. So Heather commented, they're sharing it uh, because they think it's a cool thing to do. This is groups of, of young men particularly. They do not realize the effect it actually has on the person. And I think if they were more aware of that, even if it was just one of them that changed their view, it would be worth it. So needing some sort of forum in which individuals and here perpetrators can shift their perspective on understanding the nature and experiences. Fiona talked about, I think then the most important thing would be properly understood it and how much it affected me and then that he changed his view and I would like him to actually face me. There's very much uh, in, in our work talking to survivors, as many uh, in other in studies have, have shown as well, these kind of concerns as well with the criminal justice system. So Kimberly here was a weary of engaging with the criminal justice system. And it was re never really on her radar, she said, because he was 20 at the time, the perpetrator, and I thought, I don't know really what could happen, but I just thought he's very young, and actually the person who he is when he's 40 or 50 years old is probably not going to be that same person, and is it worth ruining so much for him? Now, thinking about the presentations this morning about university students, this is a sense I've certainly had in my work in the university with uh, women who've experienced sexual violence and why they want a university response and not the police. And I've, I've had students talking about not wanting to ruin his life, but wanting something, which is why they've turned to the universities. And another, another woman talked about wanting some kind of punishment. It, it, again, they're not quite sure what you get, in, it, which is common in this work, isn't it? But not prison, she said. Now, what this led to, though, is, is, is a kind of a sense of kind of pseudo criminal justice responses, some sort of informal police responses. And I think this might be the sort of thing that Fiona might be talking about later, some of it coming on to a little bit. So Adele talked about at the time, I think I really wanted the police to go and talk to her to give her a fright. I didn't want them to prosecute her. But I just wanted them to go around and say, you've done something really bad to this person. And if you do something like this again, you're going to go to jail. So there's some sort of state response that what you've done is wrong and, and don't do it again, but not the kind of punitive system that we're, many of us are embedded in. And another informal response that Sarah got, um, who'd had um, altered images of her uploaded, the police officer gave the perpetrator an informal caution, told him to take the images down, or that you know, basically they'd come round and go through all his computers. It was a threat, it was a complete bluff, but it did seem to do the trick and they were take, those images were taken down within 20 minutes. She did later say though, this, you see this kind of shift, she felt a bit more secure and confident. I was a bit angry that he hadn't had anything more serious, but she said at least it meant he knew it absolutely wasn't on. So I think here as well, you've got quite an interesting weighing and balancing it, it here about wanting some sort of consequences, some sort of change, but not quite being sure exactly what that might look like in the end. So I think with thinking here, I've been talking about and sharing some of these survivor perspectives where they're looking beyond the conventional criminal justice system, particularly beyond the punitive criminal justice system for some sort of justice responses. And they take a variety of different forms. But what I was also want to hold at the same time, though, is that for some survivors, a criminal justice response in some shape is what they want and is what they see as justice. So in the intimate image abuse context, you've got a survivor here, one of them talking about the law has got to catch up and others who did report to the police because they wanted some sort of uh, criminal justice consequence. And when I've been thinking about these issues around criminalization and the criminal justice response, I've got, I went back recently to uh, some of the work I did on kaleidoscopic justice and in interviews with those survivors a number of years ago. 
And mostly over the last few years, I've been talking about beyond the criminal justice system and using the voices of those survivors to talk about that and say we have to listen to this and move beyond the criminal justice system. But going back to that work was really interesting because some of the survivors talked about wanting a criminal justice solution, um, not something I'd been emphasizing for many years. Um, perhaps I ought to be as well. So one of those survivors talked about the only kind of justice, as she saw it, was prison for the sexual violence she'd experienced. Other, other studies you know, have, have a similar balance. Una Brooks-Hayes' study of why women report to the police, one of them talked about she reported knowing that I wanted him jailed. That was what she wanted. That was the, the justice option for her. Also, in, in um, the work I have just done recently about criminal, criminalization, I talked about this organization, IMCAN, who's a British organization who work with black and minoritized women survivors of sexual violence and other forms of violence against women. And in one of their recent reports, they talk about how some women want to access justice by the criminal justice system, because for them, it's an important objective for many survivors. And another example of this sort of challenge, if you like, uh, when thinking about criminalization and alternatives and what justice means. Another organization in, in the UK, South All Black Sisters, that works again primarily with um, Asian women experiencing violence against women and girls. So Rahila Gupta from South All Black Sisters has talked about how the police, of course, are not an effective response to violence against women. It's like, yeah, of course they're not and solutions to patriarchy need to be found. But she says at the same time, meanwhile, women are being beaten, killed, and need support to escape violent men, and often police intervention is needed. She talked about how they are trying to do intersectionality differently, working with the police where necessary, but holding them to account where possible. <laughs> Negotiating the minefield, she talks about, of conflicting priorities around race and gender engaging in the police. And this is obviously in a context in the UK where you have particularly high levels of policing and imprisonment of black and Asian and other minority men. But she also talked about how community solutions, these alternatives, um, can be a challenge too. She says, women come to Southall Black Sisters as a last resort when family, community, elders, and all the classic instruments of support have not only failed to remedy the situation, but have reinforced it. So she talks about how communities also cannot be held accountable in the same way as the state. It's not a straightforward binary between transformative um, approaches, perhaps, and the criminal justice system. She's talking about the conflicts in their ongoing work. So I want to, it's stepping back from some of that um, everyday work that they're doing, think about some of these issues in a, in a kind of more normative, wider context and why we might also continue to engage with the criminal justice system. And for me, I think it's the argument that without change, um, the law and the criminal justice system will continue to ignore women's harms, marginalize our experiences, and neglect to recognize them or provide redress. So it will carry on doing that, yeah, you know, even if, if we, we disengage. So for me, it's engaging with the law, therefore is this complex equation with trying to harness what it can be a transformative power, but whilst also resisting, trying to resist its capacity to reinforce, which it undoubtedly does as well, disadvantage and oppression. But for me, to abandon that terrain of the criminal justice system and the criminal law, I think for me would be to concede ground to what could be a potential uh, powerful tool for abuse against uh, violence against women and girls. And in the image-based sexual abuse context, it's got a particular residence because it would also risk new criminal laws being adopted where there's movements around the world in this area that do not adequately or effectively recognize and redress the justice from victim survivors perspectives. Those laws will get adopted. For me, it's about trying to get them victim centered then and victims perspectives on justice integrated. So I, I'm talking here about this you know, growing uh, area, if you like, talking about anti-carceral feminism. Um, 
and carceral being that uh, lure of the state and the particularly around imprisonment and the carceral state. And anti-carceral feminism, those resisting the use of the criminal law and the crim criminalization, do seek to want to reduce harms against women, men, and um, everyone in society. Aya Gruber, who's written about this, talks about how feminists should adopt an unconditional stance against criminalization, no matter the issue. And for me, though, this uh, definitive approach to criminalization and criminal justice system, it risks reifying the kind of current status quo um, and removes any opportunity for change and reform because it's accepting what's there and we don't do anything more. For me, I think it risks setting in stone some stereotypical assumptions about uh, sexual violence as well. Aya Gruber talks about minor offences um, and she talks about non-consensual sharing of intimate images as bad internet behaviour. And for me, the risk here is you're creating a hierarchy of offences, which you know, many of us have tried to challenge over the years about how sexual violence is not experienced um, by all victim survivors in the same way and, and understanding it as a continuum, as Liz Kelly would talk about, and non-hierarchical. And I think the risk here is that you set in stone some of those uh, hierarchies because you've got the existing criminal offences and we won't make any changes or do anything more. I also don't think it explains why some survivors' voices are privileged over others and not explain why some survivors should be able to pursue redress through the criminal justice system, existing laws on rape. Um, so a survivor of rape has an option to go through the criminal justice system. But someone who's had um, sexual images of them taken and maybe shared without their consent um, has gone viral and the harms could be life shattering and life ending for some, they're not to get the opportunity then to have their justice interests served through the criminal justice system. And I'm not saying that's the option for everyone and I'm not saying it's the most effective or the most suitable, but I'm saying for some, it should be, in my view, an option if that's what they seek. So I guess what I'm trying to, it's not particularly original here, I know, uh, say that nuance and complexity and listening to all survivors' voices is a good thing. Um, so I wanted to encourage this complicated though and nuanced approach to the justice deficit. And I guess, um, I think that is getting lost in some debates about this. I think I want to imagine a criminal justice system that's not predicated on punitivism. And I guess I don't want to give up on that imaginary project to see what that might look like. I don't know what it's going to look like. In the same ways, we don't know what some transformative systems are going to look like either. It's, it's an ongoing project. I think we need to listen to the voices of all survivors, even when that's uncomfortable. And for many people, it's uncomfortable to actually hear survivors say they want a restorative justice option. That's actually an uncomfortable statement for, for some. On the other hand, it's a very uncomfortable statement that some actually want uh, a perpetrator to go to prison. And I think we have to live with this uncomfortable nature if we're going to actually listen to survivor perspectives and try and integrate them into our work and our uh, reforms. So I, I want to recognize the role of criminal justice and alternatives at the same time. And uh, this, you know, it seems to me is an approach that it should be fully alive to the risks and challenges of all justice approaches, whether they're state-backed criminal sanctions, restorative justice or transformative justice. They all come with their problems and challenges, as I try to identify when using the example of Southall Black Sisters. And so I just think imagination is needed from everyone seeking these less harmful ways to tackle violence against women and girls from criminal justice perspectives, prison abolition, or all uh, anything, if you like, almost in between, so that we can try uh, reduce this justice deficit that we're here to talk about and do it in a way that's listening to the voices of survivors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so the last speaker in this panel is Mailen Skilbre, Nesten. Um, the floor is yours, and I think we. Do you yeah, have some? Yeah, okay. Oh. 
I touched this so now. <coughs> yeah, you can fix it from there. <laughs> I touched uh, something here. It's because of this. I just need my laptop here. Just causing some havoc. Someone has to. Yeah. <laughs> the background for my... Okay, so there's the mic. The background for my paper is very relevant pertaining to class because I've become more and more interested in these kind of critiques coming from within feminism towards criminal justice and uh, sometimes also very caricatured versions of what criminal justice can accomplish or lack of accomplishment of criminal justice. Uh, so I've called my paper Criminal Law Reform on Sexual Violence, a Feminist Win, Penal Populism, or both, um, because I'm interested in how criminal law's approach to criminal justice has gone, undergone radical changes in many or most European jurisdictions in the last few decades. Definitions have expanded and punishments have become more severe. There are conflicting views on how to best, best understand these developments. On the one hand, the female victim of sexual violence is often presented as a lever for more punitive approaches to crime more generally as a strategic instrument for penal populism. Further, some also argue, also regard the broader definition and harder instruments, punishments for sexual violence as based on moralism or as a prime example of the overreach of the modern state. On the other hand, this development can be interpreted as a case of a recalibration of law and punishment in light of new knowledge and thinking about the harm of sexual violence. These conflicting interpretations of the development continue to coexist. And I want to use this uh, to uh, with the, use the case of Norway to discuss these different interpretations. In 1994, the Norwegian Attorney General stated that rape was punished too leniently in Norway and that punishment levels likely should be doubled. A few years later, this was a reality and a norm, what was called a normal rape went from receiving a sentence of two years imprisonment to four years. And this is not the only change that has taken place. In the last 22 years, the sentencing level for rape has increased also after that, both on paper and in practice. A minimum sentence has been introduced, which is not very much used in the Norwegian penal law. Rape now carries a mandatory prison sentence, while other crimes, including other forms of serious crime, have access to a broader range of alternatives in Norway. The rape provision has been expanded several times and now includes acts that used to be considered lesser crimes, such as sex with, a, with an incapacitated person or other sexual acts than vaginal penetration is included today, including masturbation. And there is a low threshold for rape, lower threshold for rape. Uh, for example, a brief partial penetration is no longer considered attempted rape, but a full-blown rape. The political introduction has also been a political introduction of normal sentencing standard, thus harnessing the legal discretion of the judges. And such developments are often considered part of a politicization of punishment and is not normal in criminal, Norwegian criminal law. Uh, a provision criminalizing gr gross negligent rape was also introduced. And as you've heard earlier today from Solveig Lagerö, assistance for victims of rape is directly or indirectly tied to the criminal justice process more than before. The legal regulation of rape has un thus undergone major shift in a little over two decades. And to contextualize this, I can mention that what is considered traditional crimes, such as provisions on violence or economic crimes, have not in the same period undergone much change. Changes in other provisions are also often not debated much, but are left to law committees and politicians, not media and public debate. So in these areas, changes are considered technical, not political. So there is something about the field of sexual offenses going on. And these shifts in the legal regulation of rape took place in a situation where feminists and victim advocates gained increased, Im increasing impact and where, and where considerable shifts took place 
in knowledge and norms on the relationship between gender and sexuality and violence generally, and sexual violence specifically. There is more knowledge about rape, its prevalence, its causes, its manifestations, uh, and its consequences for victims. Prevalence studies have shifted interpretations of the etiology of rape, as one used to consider rape, assumed that rape was an act, a very rare act, and therefore often interpreted as an act of a pathological individual, more than as a consequence of gender and sexuality norms. So actually surveys uh, of self, uh, with self-reported cases were able to kind of shift the idea of what, why rape was taking place. Uh, not an exceptional act, but a continuation with the norm. Uh, and uh, uh, over time, debates have also reflected better in Norway that rape is about more than attacks from a stranger. So while rape committed by strangers still, still often attract much attention, it was previously regarded as the paradigmatic case of rape. And this is, in my opinion, no longer the case. In the last decade, more attention has been directed towards rape taking place in romantic and social relations, not least related to partisan alcohol. Further, over time, uh, there has been a shift in how the consequences of rape has been presented. And it's established more than before that the harm of rape goes beyond being a breach of the integrity of the body, the sense of decency of the victim, or the mo moral sentiment of society. It is today formulated as an attack on personhood. Uh, the simultaneity of feminist engagement with sexual violence and the mentioned shift in criminal justice policies makes it easy to make the case that Norway is a prime example of what Elizabeth Bernstein calls carceral feminism. With this term, she refers to a, quote, a cultural and political formation in which previous generations' justice and liberation struggles are recast in carceral terms, end of quote. Uh, this and similar terms have gained considerable tra traction in the last few years, also among feminists. Uh, and I find the stepwise increase in punishment um, levels, uh, the argument that consequences for victim mean that... Uh, so in the, in the Norwegian context, I find that the stepward increase of punishment levels, the needs of victims was an important argument. Uh, and even though punishment generally in Norway is first and foremost argued for on preventive grounds, in parliamentary discussions about harsher punishment on rape or other sexual offenses, um, there has to a larger degree been a focus on uh, proportionality with the harm and concerns for the victim. In a law proposal from 2010, it was stated in relation to the proposal of harsher penalties Quote, the punishment level must reflect that rape is one of the most serious crimes against a person's physical, mental, and sexual integrity and will for most have a profound harmful effect that reduces the life quality of the person affected. This goes for all kinds of rape, not only attacks and rapes where violence was involved, but also for rapes committed against people who are unable to resist the act. End of quote. The punishment level on rape was at this point already increased considerably, and as the quote demonstrates, the argument for the need for harsher penalties is the harm the act causes victims. It's an argument about proportionality. The need for criminal law to prevent future crimes is not at all mentioned in the whole law proposal. The explicit argument for increasing punitiveness in the face of rape and other forms of sexual violence in this and other cases has been the concern of victims. Still, this does not mean that feminists drove the development. It could also be that feminist argumentation has been appropriated by other agendas. So the definition Bernstein gives for carceral feminism separates this from such appropriation. And with reference to the analysis of Gottschalk, Bumiller, and others, she contends that feminism is implicated, not appropriated, in the current penal overreach. In looking at developments in debates and policies in Canada, Lisa Gottel criticizes this assumption. Uh, and um, um, uh, with references to how neoliberal agendas have appropriated but also transformed feminism. Feminisms are, feminism uh, is thus not to blame when states increasingly means, meet sexual offenses with carceral strategies, she argues. 
And different from what Bernstein's and others claim, feminists have emphasized alternative justice strategies in this and other, and has in other ways contributed to the demo, um, de-demonization of sexual offenders, argues Gotel. This resonates with developments in Norway, where, uh, where research, also feminist research, has drawn attention away from the idea that the real rape is an attack committed by a pathological stranger, and has instead demonstrated that rape, in where and why it takes place, needs to be regarded in continuity with gender and sexuality norms. Further, Gottel argues that feminist claims and victims' advocacy is often conflated in debates on carceral feminism and similar terms. When looking more closely at the case of Norway, uh, it is clear that developments can be interpreted in different ways. It is impossible to understand the development towards harsher punishments for rape without recognizing great investments made by the women's movement in shifting understandings of the reasons behind and harms of rape. A central aspect of Nordic feminism altogether is that it has very explicitly turned to criminal law as an instrument for achieving gender equality. And acts such as rape are commonly viewed as a result of an expression of gender inequality, but also an attack on and sometimes things thing that is detrimental to gender inequality. This means that gender equality is seen as a tool to prevent crimes such as rape. The way Nordic feminist organizations have prioritized sexual violence in, um, and um, uh, has impacted how public debate around criminal justice emerged and developed because their position in the region and the strength of the women's movement and the mobilization. Uh, feminist research and activism has shifted how sex rape can be represented. Uh, further, uh, feminist research and activism shifted how uh, sexual autonomy more clearly can, is, frames the issue than previously. And this is high, highly gendered. Another factor uh, that might have impacted the develop development of criminal policies on rape is a more punitive, in a more punitive direction is the position of the victim and the power of victim advocacy. There has been a lack of satisfaction with how criminal justice is working for victims in Norway. Few cases are taken to court. There, there is not necessarily a lot the government can do about this in the case of rape. It is argued evidence continue to be hard to, diff to uh, prove. But this sense of injustice feeds the demand for law revisions. Victim adv advocacy is often on behalf of children in Norway, but it still often might affect the development also regarding crimes against adults. A standard argument in Norwegian debates is that, quote, punishments are too lenient for sex crimes, particularly when committed against a child, end of quote. And this is then the, applied as a general argument. Uh, the use of criminal justice strategies in the face of sexual harms has received considerable criticism from key feminist thinkers in the last few years. Feminists turning to the state and relying on punitive approaches has been criticized for contributing to neoliberal agendas, neo-colonial, classist and racist agendas, as well as, as cultures of control. Uh, a key argument in the literature is also that underlying structural and normative reasons why sexual offenses are committed and have uh, the ramifications they have is hidden by the individual gaze of the criminal law. Linda Alcoff, in her 2018 book, Rape and Resistance, offers such a critique. Quote, it is a mistake to designate the legal arena as the principal site for addressing the, the, heart, the problem of sexual violations. The aim of courts is to establish individual culpability, while advocates, scholars, and victims and their supporters are more often interested in social change analysis and understanding. End of quote. In addition to the possible detrimental effects of criminal justice in how it harms men of color and white, work, white working class men, uh, how it hides societal factors and thus hinder more sustainable long-term justice strategies, feminists also argue that it is not worth it. Criminal justice offers little in the way of justice to victim survivors. Uh, as mentioned earlier, normative shifts in Norway means that these interpretations are not an obvious um, fit. Further, while it is reasonable to assume that feminist, argue, feminist activism and scholarship and the close alignment with the state, what uh, the Norwegian political scientist Helga Harnes terms state feminism, which is a more 
positive spin on the relationship between feminism and the state than Janet Haley's term, governance feminism, has impacted penal policies in Norway. But the carceral part of the term carceral feminism may be more in line with US and UK development, which often serve as a reference point in this, in, points in this literature. It is important to note that the development of understandings and regulations of rape in Norway has taken place in a context where criminal justice is marked by compar comparatively low levels of punishment. Yep. Uh, a low prison population, widespread use of other sanctions than imprisonment, uh, penal innovation designs to pro protect vulnerable groups of inmates, an elaborate system of transition from prison to ordinary society, which taken together is often referenced as penal exceptionalism of the Nordic countries or Scandinavia. While this assertion has also been criticized, uh, it is clear that Nordic societies on the whole are less punitive than punishment uh, and that punishments are more humane. Levels of punishments are lower and the prison population is lower than in many or most European countries. There is though one no notable exception, the punishment of sexual offenses. In the last two decades, several of the Nordic countries have changed the rape legislation and punishment levels considerably. And without having compared them in detail, I would say that it looks like Norway's approach has changed the most. The willingness to punish sex crime seems to make such crime an exception to the Nordic exceptionalism, is the argument of Henrik Thun. So while Norway, for example, is not generally a carceral society, nothing like the US or UK, it is more carceral in the face of sexual offenses than in other areas. Uh, uh, the culture of control that David Garland posits as dispersing the penal welfare structure, uh, while this is oriented towards rehabilitation, proportionate punishment, the due process, it is said to be replaced by more puni punitive responses. While the general diagnosis still sits uneasy with Norwegian development, it is worth noting that the emergence of the victim as a powerful figure in debate about criminal justice and the way politicians express a desire to use criminal justice expressively are also developments that have occurred in Norway. We have seen a degree of politicization of penal law. A question of punishment have become a matter for party politics, not only experts. The populist right party, the progress party, which has been in office for two periods, but not now, uh, emphasizes the harm uh, crime has on its victims. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in addition, reasons for shifts, uh, and in addition to these explanations that are often given in the literature about increasing levels of punishment, is that shifts are taking place in the phenomenon, that there are uh, concrete cases that uh, energizes public debate. For example, the 2012 New Delhi rape, which uh, speeded up and shifted already ongoing discussions about rape law and kind of other incidents of rape that seem to drive policy development. But I find no kind of evidence that these individual cases seem to impact Norwegian law. Uh, criminal justice continue to be the preferred response to many of the sexual offenses in Norway. But the capacity for the criminal justice to deliver justice to victim is continually criticized. Lack of justice in the form of low prosecution levels and shaming of victims happen. But still, there is not a great interest in Norway on extending restorative justice. And reforms, reforms in the comp compensation system has, as I mentioned, been driven towards less independence from criminal justice. But there is still a strong belief in Norway about rehabilitation of offenders. There are no efforts to introduce offender registers or similar there are no large-scale retraction of welfare states similar to elsewhere, thus not the remasculinization of the state that Bernstein lists as part of the scaffold for carceral feminism. Criminal policy is also not on the top of the agenda. Health, labor, and education is measured in media attention and the platforms of political parties. A law committee is currently assessing the need for further law revisions of rape and other sexual offenses. And there will be an ongoing debate on this in Norway. But rape and other sexual offenses in Norway, as I mentioned, are met with more uh, punitive approaches than before. And feminists have indeed been more active in promoting such a development than in many other countries. There are strong alliances between feminist activism and the state in Norway than many other countries. 
the diagnosis behind carceral feminism and similar concepts are still not necessarily well suited, as the alliances between po penal policies, neoliberalism, conservative sexual mores, welfare state retraction and populism than Bernstein of other purport are not traceable in the same way. While Norway, it, at first glance, shared developments with many countries, understanding this as part of an overarching trend is not sufficient. It is not necessarily linked between the way debates develop and the severity of punishment. This is evident when comparing developments in Sweden and Norway. They are neighboring countries, and both are countries where sexual violence has received a lot of attention. Criminal policies are on top of political agendas in Sweden more than in Norway, and rape is a recurring topic in public debate in Sweden in a way there is in Norway. Still, punishment levels are much more lenient in Sweden than in Norway in the face of rape. An incident of a, what's called a simple act of penetrative rape bears a maximum sentence of six years in Sweden and 15 years in Norway. So it's not easy to align the level of debate and the level of punishment. Analysis of the relationship between feminism and criminal law are too often too simple or lacks explanatory power outside the context where they were developed. Global reach of developments are stated but not demonstrated. And I invite more debate on the applicability of concepts that are rapidly gaining a status as, as blanket explanations. Thank you.